Hello, my name is Dr. Peter Lakowski, and I'm a sports specialist chiropractor. Today, I'll be talking about sciatica. Contrary to what most people believe, sciatica is not a diagnosis per se. It's a description of symptoms created by inflammation of the sciatic nerve and its branches. It typically affects one side of the body with varied intensity of radiating and at times electrical pain. There are four main areas we'll talk about today. First, we'll take a look at the anatomy and function of the spine region. Next, we'll talk about three common causes of sciatica. Disc injury, lumbar spinal stenosis, and piriformis syndrome. So let's start with a quick anatomy lesson. Here are the lumbar intervertebral discs. They are made up of fiber cartilage and together with the end plates of the adjacent vertebral bodies above and below them, they form a fibrocartilaginous joint called the symphysis. The symphysis allows for small movements and acts as a major shock absorber in the spine. There are a total of 23 of these discs in the spinal column and they generally get larger the lower they are within the spine. Right next to the intervertebral discs are the spinal nerves, which pass through the intervertebral foramen made up of the adjacent vertebrae. These nerve roots join and contribute to the sciatic nerve proper. Discs are composed of two parts. The annulus fibrosus is the tougher fibrous outer portion of the disc and is made up of concentric sheets of tough collagen fibers. The annulus fibrosus surrounds the inner nucleus pulposus which is made up of loose collagen and proteoglycans that create a gel-like substance. The annulus fibrosus functions as a seal around the nucleus pulposus. Together, they act as a shock absorber by distributing any pressure and force imposed on the intervertebral disc. From this perspective, you can see how the structure of the disc resembles that of a jelly donut. The spinal discs get deformed by loads placed on them. They compress and expand with vertical loads, but bending movements of the spine displace the discal material in the opposite direction. Spinal flexion, for example, places more load on the anterior portion of the disc, pushing the nucleus pulposus posteriorly. It is mechanics such as these that can lead to disc injury, which brings us to the first pathology that commonly gives rise to sciatica. Disc injury occurs when external forces placed on the disc cause it to deform. The most common scenario is when the gel-like nucleus pulposus begins to migrate out of its central core posteriorly due to disruption of the rings of the annulus fibrosus. Lumbar spinal flexion along with compressive loads of the spine frequently give rise to this injury. Prolapsing is sometimes fully herniating the discal material in the posterior lateral direction where the posterior longitudinal ligament is absent. In this scenario, the vulnerable nerve roots are exposed to the mechanical pressure created by this disc prolapse. The L5-S1 intervertebral disc is the most commonly affected by such an injury, putting the S1 nerve root in harm's way, resulting in a constellation of symptoms related to sciatica and usually accompanied by moderate to severe low back pain. While staying at the level of the spine, let's discuss another cause of sciatica. Mechanical compression by degenerated spinal structures can lead to injured nerve roots. As a person ages, their spine begins to progressively show more and more of its own gray hairs in the form of degenerative disc disease, bony spurs, and thickened or hypertrophied ligaments. These spinal changes can eventually begin to narrow the space and affect the nerve roots, especially just prior to their exit through the intervertebral foramen. This can cause sciatica in addition to other clinical symptoms. This condition is called lumbar spinal stenosis. A history of injury to the spine, as well as other occupational and physical characteristics may predispose someone to this condition. Spinal stenosis differs from sciatica caused by disc herniation because it is generally only seen in patients over the age of 50, and the symptoms tend to be more transient in nature. Frequently, the symptoms are related to extension movements of the lumbar spine or activities such as prolonged walking or standing and are relieved by sitting in a stooped forward position. Now let's move on to the final point of our discussion today. Piriformis syndrome, as you might guess, affects the piriformis, a deep posterior gluteal region muscle originating from the anterior surface of the sacrum and coursing laterally under the greater sciatic notch to attach to the greater trochanter of the femur. As you can see, the piriformis is intimately related to the sciatic nerve, which is why it is the most common cause of sciatica not originating from the spine. Often seen in athletes and pregnant women, the proposed mechanisms for piriformis syndrome include sciatic nerve compression, most frequently due to either a contracture or hypertonicity of the muscle from trauma or overuse, excessive hypertrophy of the muscle, or congenital variations of the sciatic nerve or the piriformis. In any scenario, the result is mechanical compression or tethering of the nerve leading to irritation or inflammation, classic sciatica. 
While typical sciatica symptoms may be transient and often exacerbated by activity or sitting, buttock pain tends to be the predominant symptom in individuals with this condition. So that brings us to the end of our discussion today. We talked about important anatomy and function related to sciatica. We talked about disc injury, lumbar spinal stenosis, and piriformis syndrome. I used Visible Body's Muscle Premium to show you the anatomy and pathology related to sciatica. Thank you for watching.